Sunday of Easter as we continue the theme of Easter overcoming. Today as we look at 1 John chapter 4, we're going to see that God's truth overcomes false prophets. We're going to follow the order of worship for service of word and sacrament. It's printed in your service folder. You can also follow along with the screen. We're opening hymn is hymn 505, Love is the Gracious Gift. Thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do 
what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all of your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. your gracious will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. First lesson for our consideration as we celebrate the sixth Sunday of Easter is found in Acts chapter 11, beginning with verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that took place at the time of Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some men from Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and also began to speak to the Greeks, preaching the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number of people believed and turned to the Lord. A report about this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to go on to Antioch. When he arrived and saw God's grace, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. He was a good man who was full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a large number of people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a large number of people. It was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our second lesson is found in the first letter of John, reading from the fourth chapter, which will serve as the basis for our sermon this evening. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is already in the world. You are from God, dear children, and you have overcome the false prophets because the one in you is greater than the one in the world. They are from the world. That is why they speak from a worldly perspective, and the world listens to them. We are from God. The one who knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we can distinguish between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Dear friends, let us love one another, because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love has not known God, because God is love. This is how God's love for us was revealed. God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we may live through him. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us so much, we also should love one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. <clears throat> the Gospel for the sixth Sunday of Easter is the Gospel according to John, reading from the 15th chapter. As the Father has loved me, so also I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you hold on to my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have held on to my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy would continue to be in you and that your joy would be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you continue to do the things I instruct you. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, because everything that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will endure, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. These things I am instructing you, so that you love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day in 365, Love Divine, All Love Itself.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For sure, God's word for consideration is found in 1 John chapter 4. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Will the real Jesus please stand up? Maybe that statement or question grabs your attention, and I think it's intended to do so. It's actually the title of a book that some of us here at Eastside went through last year. And that provocative title immediately came to mind as I was studying for the sermon this week. <clears throat> John tells us to test the spirits to see if they are from God. Well, how do we do that? He says, every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God. And that sounds simple enough, right? But it's more nuanced than that. People claim a lot of things about Jesus that just simply aren't true. People turn Jesus into someone who he is not and who he was never meant to be. And John says when people do that, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming and is already in the world. That, that's right. There is a spirit out there right now who is actively working against Christ, actively working to keep our attention off of the real Jesus. So what can we do? John says, test the spirits. And that's exactly what we are going to do today. Today we are going to see that God's truth overcomes false prophets. Listen again to John's encouragement. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and is already in the world. From God's point of view, this issue of spiritual teachers is of enormous importance. That's what John calls the spirits here. They're spiritual teachers. Word and sacrament need to be brought to people because we are not born with them. Spiritual infants need strong spiritual leadership and sound teaching to help them grow. We need those spiritual teachers to bring us word and sacrament so that we can grow our faith. But the question is, who do you believe? Isn't that the question that we've been asking over and over again over the past year and a half? With so many different people talking and sometimes seeming to say the exact opposite things, who do you believe? It's hard to know who to believe. How much more important is it to ask that question spiritually? Who do you believe? Well, we can't believe everyone. We can't believe everyone because everyone seems to have their own version of truth. And actually, if you try to believe everyone, it's almost more dangerous than if you believe no one. So who do you believe? What's the test? What do we look for? Do we look for signs and wonders that impress? Are we captivated by charisma, personal magnetism? Do we demand success and power? Are we drawn to great scholarship and intellect? Well, some of these things are good in and of themselves. They cannot be the test for sound and teaching. It can't be the standard. So instead, John gives us the standard. 
And he reminds us that no, we can't see the heart of those teachers. We can't see the heart of the spirits. We don't know exactly what they believe in their heart, but we can see their confession. What does their confession say? Do they confess that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh? If not, they're not preaching the real Jesus. Now certainly a person's confession is not limited to one or two doctrines, and that's not what John is saying here. But the test begins with Jesus. The doctrine of Jesus, that he is true man and true God in the same person, is at the center. And this teaching is so central to our faith and so important that protecting it is what prompted the writing of both the Nicene and Athanasian creeds. Anyone who denies this truth is clearly a false prophet. But John says we can overcome these false prophets. You are from God, dear children, and you have overcome the false prophets, because the one in you is greater than the one in the world. They are from the world. The one who knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. That is how we can distinguish between the spirit of truth in the spirit of error. How do we overcome? How do we test the spirits? John gives us a second avenue. He says, ask yourself the question, where are they getting their information? To whom are they speaking? False prophets are not getting their information from God or from his word. John says, the one who knows God listens to us. One, whoever is not from God does not listen to us. All false teachers are drawing their information from sources other than the Bible. Whether it's pagan philosophy or rationalism or scientific discovery or some human idea, they are from the world, John says. They speak the language of the world. They want to change the scriptures into the language of the world so it sounds more palatable. And sometimes it feels like they're winning, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems like those who are from the world are the ones who are growing and succeeding. But remember, outward success is not an indicator of spiritual truth. Earthly gains aren't heavenly ones. John reminds us, you are from God, dear children. You have overcome the false prophets because the one in you is greater than the one in the world. Even though our eyes may deceive us, even though it may look like the world is winning, we have overcome these false prophets because God is greater than the devil, because Jesus defeated Satan. And now, John encourages us to demonstrate that victory, to demonstrate that truth that we are from God by putting it into action. Dear friends, let us love one another, because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love has not known God, because God is love. This is how God's love for us was revealed. God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we may live through him. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us so much, we should also love one another. If you can remember from a couple weeks ago when John refers to us as friends, He's really saying, beloved, or loved ones. You see the word play here in verse 7? Loved ones, let us love. Believers who are bound together in confession of the real Jesus are going to show that unity by loving. And how are we able to love? Because God has first loved us. Because we have been born of God and we know God, that, that word for know here is knowing by experience. We have experienced God 
as he dwells in our hearts through faith. And that's why John can say that those who don't love don't know God. They don't have God dwelling in them. They haven't experienced God's love. They don't have faith. But we, the loved ones, do. And not only does John say that we are to love, but he defines exactly what that love is. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Sent his, sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What is love? Love is doing what is best for the benefit of someone else without any personal consideration of the cost or consequences to yourself. And we see that kind of love in action in God's action of sending Jesus. This is the real Jesus, the one who was willing to take on human flesh, the one who humbled himself under the law, who lived a perfect life under that law for the entire world, the one who then willingly gave up that life as the sacrifice for sins that would once again make the whole world at peace with God. This is love. And if this past year and a half has taught us anything, it's that everyone needs to feel loved. On a scale of needs, love has to be at the top of the list. Love makes us feel like we have worth, like we are somebody. It is one of the highest and most important things that a parent can do for a child's well-being. And our Heavenly Father shows us just how much He cares because every year He gives us Christmas and Good Friday. Annual reminders about how serious God is about adopting us into His family, about how seriously God loves us. And these are priceless thoughts that we can go back to again and again when doubts creep in. Doubts creep in about God's love. You see, the world doesn't know God. And so when the world looks at the conditions that we're living in, it quickly concludes that God is either powerless, or he's mean, or he's imaginary. And their evidence seems overwhelming. How can there be a loving God in the presence of COVID and cancer war and divorce and rape and child molestation how can there be a loving god with all those things but christmas and good friday and easter overcome those doubts and those conclusions god has prepared the response to the greatest of human misery he has found a way for us to be with him forever in heaven, for free, through Jesus. And if all of that is true, if God loves us so much, and John says, we should also love one another. Now, I've never been there in person, but the waters of the Dead Sea are so saturated with salt that if you wade into them, you will naturally, automatically float. It's a, it's a very neat phenomenon. However, that water is unfit to drink, and it's useless for irrigation, <clears throat> because water only flows into the Dead Sea. Nothing ever flows out. In the same way, love needs to keep moving, or we will stagnate. If we love one another, God's love is made complete, and then love stimulates more love. And in this way, hatred is melted, and wounds are healed, and grudges are forgotten, and grievances are forgiven. Hope is shared, and emptiness is filled, and loneliness 
is eased in human hearts. Friends, this is the test. Do the spiritual teachers hold forth the real Jesus? Do they hold forth the Jesus who lived and died and rose to save you? Do they encourage you to love based on the love that God has shown you? I pray that's the Jesus that is standing before you today. Because this Jesus and his truth is the one who has overcome the devil. And it's this Jesus and his truth that allows us to overcome false prophets. May this Jesus move you to action, to love one another, because God has so loved you. Amen. Please stand. Now may that peace of God which surpasses our understanding may keep you in your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, the congregation takes time to think about the blessings that God has given us and to thank God for the opportunity to exercise our faith by giving off. special prayers today. We ask for God's blessing on the family of Lisa Beal, whose nephew died tragically and unexpectedly this past week. We pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for reconciling us to yourself through the sufferings and death of your dear Son. Through him we have the confidence to enter into your presence and to bring you our prayers and petitions. Out of the infinite bounty of your goodness, grant us a rich measure of your spirit. Let the love of Christ fill your church, so that it may flourish in all good works. Help us show love and compassion for all who are in need. 
He saw in the nations of the earth the knowledge of your mercy, that they may turn to you, the only God, and find salvation in you. Strengthen our faith so that we unfailingly come to you in prayer for all our bodily needs. Give a special measure of your power to those who are sorrowful or mourning, to those who are in pain or sickness, to those who may be in temptation or peril, that they may receive your blessed aid. Help us patiently endure any chastening and afflictions you permit to come into our lives, knowing that you are using them in love to prepare us for that joyful communion with you, which is ours for all eternity. Merciful Father, how mysterious are your judgments and your ways beyond our understanding. We are grieved by this untimely death, yet we seek refuge in your love, for you have assured us that it is more than, more than sufficient for our weaknesses. In these dark hours, help us make diligent use of your word and sacraments, <clears throat> so that by faith we may be able to resist the evil foe who seeks to destroy our souls, minds, and bodies. Take into your care those whose hearts and lives are so deeply affected by this tragedy, and lead them to look to you for confidence and strength to face the future. Sustain them with your merciful hand, and grant them your peace for the sake of Jesus, our mediator and redeemer. Accept our prayers and intercessions and provide for all our needs, not because we are worthy, but for the sake of Jesus, our Savior, who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
us this evening. Just have one announcement before we watch the uh, main uh, version of the Wells Connection. And that announcement is we are starting a brand new Bible study on Sunday morning at uh, 9 15. Um, the study says, What does it mean to have a pastor? And it might seem like an odd question. You might say, Well, obviously, I know what it means to have a pastor. But I think there's a lot of things that we don't think about that uh, a pastor can and should be doing for you um, if he only is able to uh, have that service. And so this is about a six week study that's going to look at different aspects of that. Um, now, you're all here tonight, so if you want to come and join us in person on Sunday morning, we'd be glad to have you. But we also are going to be streaming that uh, Bible class uh, via Zoom. So when the email goes out on uh, Thursday with the recording of this service for those who can't be with us, there will also be a link to that Bible study um, that will be live streamed uh, at 9.15. And um, it's worked out really well for some who have done it in the past. Uh, Pastor Schlick will be manning the computer, so if you have questions, he can um, you type them into the chat and he can relay those questions to the group. So that's starting this Sunday um, at 9.15. With that, we'll watch The Wells Connection. 